uh, for an introduction, an AVM, or arterial vitus malformation, it's an abnormal co collection of blood vessels. It's really a tangle of blood vessels, as it's described, and it's abnormal connections between the ar arteries and veins. And so typically in the body, the arteries start with big arteries, go to smaller arteries, down into the capillary bed, and then over to the venous side. And by going progressively into smaller blood vessels, the pressure, the high pressure in the arteries is lessened, and by the time you get to veins, you have low pressure, and that flows back to the heart. Um, with an AVM, that's, that process is disrupted early in um, uh, gestation, really. They're congenital lesions, and so what you have is you have the high-pressure blood flowing into directly into veins, and so you have a high-pressure system, and that high-pressure system uh, can cause problems. Um, Prevalence is about 18 in 100,000, so it's a pretty rare disease, but uh, there are a significant number of patients out there with AVMs, and importantly, oftentimes we find them in younger patients. That's because they're congenital lesions, uh, people are born with them, and uh, they do come to attention because of symptoms, and most of that happens before the age of 40, so that makes it extremely important. Um, here's a picture, and I don't have a pointer, I'm sorry, but this is... Um, an arteriovenous malformation. So we talked about the large arteries coming into this tangle, and the tangle is called a nidus, and that's really the high-pressure abnormal tangle of vessels. And from there, the blood goes directly into this draining vein. And normally, when you see blood in the venous system, it's blue. That's because it's had its time to pass through the capillaries and lose its oxygen, and so it's deoxygenated blood. But in an AVM, you have high pressure blood flowing through, so you actually have red veins. So if you look at an AVM on the surface of the brain, it looks red even in the veins, and that's a big problem because the veins are not designed to, um, to deal with that kind of high pressure, and so there's a tendency to bleed. Um, very can important. I'm sorry, can you explain that one more time? It's about sure. Because I thought that uh, blood didn't turn red until it hit oxygen. Correct. Okay, so how are they red in the... Well, because here, instead of the process where the blood goes through the smaller, as the blood goes through the smaller arteries down into the arterioles, then into the capillaries, when the blood vessels become so small that in the capillaries, you basically have almost single blood cells going through, and that's where all the oxygen comes out of the blood vessels, because they're thin-walled capillaries, and the blood cells are marching through, and the blood cells lose their oxygen to the tissue. And because here you're just dumping this blood into the veins directly, it stays red. There's nowhere for it to lose its oxygen. And the fact that it's oxygenated doesn't really matter in terms of this disease, but what matters is that it's very high pressure. And so it's just, it's ominous. I mean, you look at a vein and it's red, it gets, it, it looks angry, it looks swollen. That's because there's high pressure blood it's not used to dealing with. And that's where the problems come. Um, and very importantly, there's no normal brain tissue in the nidus. So this is a tangle of blood vessels. We know that there's no normal tissue there. The body developed with this tangle, and what that means is that an AVM, most, most of the time, doesn't actually cause symptoms if it, uh, until it uh, develops a situation where it's got something abnormal. For the most part, the body grows up with the AVM, and so a corollary to that is you could take the AVM out if you can take just the AVM, um, you can get away with that because there's no normal brain tissue in there. So that's very important. So because there's no normal tissue, it's often asymptomatic, and it allows us to resect the AVM without hurting a patient if we can avoid the normal brain tissue. Okay? Are they normally on the surface of the brain? Uh, they're, they can be anywhere, and so that's an important point. When they're on the surface of the brain, that's much more straightforward to remove. When they're deep in the brain, even though there's no normal brain within them, there's normal brain above them and you have to cross through that sometimes. Um, the difference between that and a, and a brain aneurysm, it's not the same thing, right? Because the brain it's, it's somewhere else. Um, well, a brain aneurysm is, is a weakness in the wall of the blood vessel, and it can develop anywhere, really, but tends to develop on the larger blood vessels of the brain at the base. And uh, because there's a weakness in the wall, there's kind of a ballooning that forms, a balloon, a bubble on the wall of the aneurysm. So um, this is kind of a larger process. There are, are oftentimes aneurysms within this nidus or even on these blood vessels, but 
if this is a picture of an ABM, an aneurysm may be just a small bump here. So it's a much more focal, localized um, disease. So they just actually just twist together, is what you're saying? Well, they, they just form like that, but they are oh, they all do. twisted together. It, it's not a progressive thing. If you look at an AVM in a kid, uh, two years old, and an AVM in an adult, 60 years old, we, we never do that study, so we never know what an AVM looks like in the same person over that many years for the most part. They can change, but not very much. They look pretty much the same. So because pretty much the architecture is going to be the same. Exactly. Except for in a kid, it's just going to be small. Older, well, yes, yeah, certainly as everything grows, it will expand. <clears throat> so what you're saying is that it's present at the time of birth, and if someone had just checked, or at the time of birth, eyes could have been kept on the ADFs. Uh, absolutely. You, you would find them if you <clears throat> looked. But, um, you know, they are not necessarily easy to find um, because find them, you need to do some special imaging to look at the blood vessels, and that's not something we routinely do on every uh, patient that's born. What, uh, I had an ABM and uh, a ruptured uh, vessel, I guess, inside the ABM. And sure. It presented, um, who was the doctor that did uh, Dr. McDougall. McDougall. Sure. Um, because of the location it was in my the area in here, and sure. uh, he mentioned to my wife that they didn't think they'd be able to repair it, like four or five times. So, what what kind of challenges does that does that make when the aneurysm is inside that ABM? Um, so you're saying because the ABM is so yeah. deep in a place that's yeah. hard to get they, to, they then just, there's an aneurysm. In that location, yeah. Um, well, the when you treat an and we'll talk a little bit more about that. When you're treating an ABM, typically your the goal is to remove it, so get around it and remove the whole thing. The a small aneurysm inside the ABM is not something surgically that you can go in and target because you're working in the ABM. Uh, you would have to. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get in there without having a, a lot of bleeding from the ABM. So the way to do that, to try to target that, would be to try to go up with a catheter and do it like what we're going to discuss, embolization. Yeah. But if it's such a small part uh, buried in that nidus, these, it's sometimes easy enough to get a uh, catheter up <coughs> near the nidus, but to navigate a catheter in here would be extremely difficult. Yeah. because the vessels are so small, so twisted, and so fragile that trying to get in there to find just that one area of concern would be extremely hazardous yeah. in a lot Probably of cases. Probably why it took them three hours. Well, you got very lucky. You had Dr. McDougall. Yeah. He, he did I agree. Super blue. He did yeah. Uh, that's, and we'll talk uh, about that a little bit, too. That's some, one of the techniques for embolization. What kind of pressure differences are between the artery and the vein? Not much. Not much but at all. Well, you're saying one's high pressure and right. one's low pressure. We're only talking... Oh, you're saying in a normal normal okay. system? Normal system, you have a systolic blood pressure of 120 and a diastolic blood pressure of 80. Uh, mean arterial pressure is somewhere a little bit lower than that. Um, venous pressure is like 5, 10. So much bigger difference. The pressure in the vein, if you... Uh, cut a vein, it oozes a little bit, but you put pressure on it, it stops by itself. You cut an artery, it spurts, and it's very hard to stop because it's very much higher pressure. So, uh, presenting symptoms, we mentioned a few of them. The, the biggest one is hemorrhage, the most common presentation, is with bleeding because of this pressure difference we talked about. Uh, ABMs can irritate the surrounding brain tissue and patients can develop seizures because of that. That's another uh, reason that they come to our attention a lot of times. Focal neurologic deficit, meaning weakness, numbness on one side or the other. And that happens for a number of reasons. Importantly, if you have this AVM, this high pressure, high flow system, it can actually steal blood from different parts of the brain because it's drawing all the blood into itself.
then it can starve some of the surrounding tissues. So patients can develop <coughs> symptoms because those parts, surrounding parts of the brain aren't getting enough blood because it's all going to the AVM. Um, headache, a lot of things can cause headache, but certainly an AVM could cause headache if it causes irritation of the covering of the brain. We mentioned there's no real pain receptors in the brain itself, but there are a lot of pain receptors uh, in the covering of the brain. So that certainly can, can uh, bring it to attention. And in some cases, they're incidental. So you get a, an imaging study for some unrelated reason in your finding. <coughs> and so um, that's the minority. But there's probably a lot of patients out there with AVMs that don't know it because they don't get pictures taken. Um, AVM rupture, we say the annual risk of rupture is between 2 and 4%. So out of 100 patients, between 2 and 4 every year will have a, will have a bleed. That means 96% don't have a bleed on, in a given year. So it's a low risk of bleed, but it does add up over time. Um, if you find a patient with a ruptured AVM, the risk of having another hemorrhage is much higher. So if we see a patient that has a ruptured AVM, it pushes us to treat it much more aggressively than if we see a patient with an unruptured where we have to consider other things. Um, the peak age for hemorrhage is young. So that means, uh, again, that's because AVMs are discovered in, younger, <coughs> in patients that are younger and they have them from birth. So the risk of them bleeding early is higher than, say, a disease like aneurysms that tend to develop later and then patients that present with bleeds from aneurysms tend to be older. Uh, at least 50% of patients present with hemorrhage, and when a patient does have a hemorrhage, 10% of patients will actually die from the hemorrhage, and 30 to 50% will be injured in some way. So this can be a, certainly a serious event if you have an AVM that bleeds. So are you always born with an AVM, or it can happen in other situations? We, we, we consider them to be developmental, so we don't, we don't consider them to develop um, later in life. When we see an AVM, we consider that it's been there in some form or another for the entirety of the life. Is there, are there any studies that indicate that heredity might have something to do with the formation? Of the Definitely, and there are some hereditary conditions that are associated with them. Most prominently is something called HHT, which is hereditary um, telangiectasias. Yeah, there's there's certainly a genetic component. We don't have that all worked out, but uh, just like aneurysms, there are uh, thought that they are hereditary, and again, there's some conditions that have a much higher rate of having AVMs. I still caught up on the pressure. Um, I have met several AVM survivors, and their stories have been that it's been a slow, long bleed mm -hmm. over months, and that it's just the arteries kind of. CP, yeah. correct? I understood their stories correct? Yeah. But you're talking about the pressure from that the AVM draws, and I guess I'm comparing it to the aneurysm yeah, pressure. Yeah, right. So an aneurysm is in all cases very, very high pressure because it's all on the artery. Uh, there's, no, there's no variation in that. In AVM, when I'm saying high pressure, high flow, relative to normal veins, they're all high pressure, high flow. But there's lots of different, there's a whole spectrum of AVMs. So there's some that have, com and different parts to the same AVM. So there's parts of an AVM and there's some AVMs that are somewhere along the spectrum of pressure where you could definitely have a bleed that's less intense than an aneurysm. And that's why we say actually with the AVM bleeds, the risk is of having a death or severe problem is lower than with aneurysm. With an aneurysm, if it ruptures, half the patients end up yeah. dying. Yeah. And with an AVM, it's a much lower because they do have a spectrum of the kind of bleeds that they can have. And it's not, um, it's not necessarily all extremely high pressure. Okay? That makes sense. <clears throat> um, so we talked about treatment options. Surgery is the classic one, radiosurgery, embolization, and then... Observation For some patients, um, watching an AVM may be appropriate. It really depends on 
where the ABM is, what the risk of resecting it is, um, versus the risk of it causing a bleed. Like we said, 2 to 4% a year for a normal ABM. That's a substantial number, but it, it's not an extremely high number. So, you know, like with, with the aneurysms, they have the different sizes where you have giant Yes. Aneurysms. Okay, so with an aneurysm, or with an AVM, do they have that same scale spectrum? Different, and we'll talk about that actually probably the next slide. Um, so there's different grading scales for AVMs, and uh, size is one determinant of how dangerous an AVM is. The real grading scale that we talk about with AVMs is actually developed by Dr. Spetzler, a Spetzler-Martin scale, and what it um, determines is really the risk of treating an AVM. It doesn't really talk about the risk of an AVM bleeding, but it talks about, based on the different characteristics, what's the risk of treating the AVM surgically. Um, and so that does break up the AVMs into small, medium, and large based on those cutoffs, three centimeters, three to six, or greater than six. Location is very important. We call some locations non-eloquent, meaning uh, that it's a part of the brain that you could uh, disrupt and not have uh, necessarily a deficit versus an eloquent site, which means that part of the brain is extremely important for function, and if there's an injury to that part of the brain or in that part of the brain, we'll see an effect. So a lot of the brain can actually be passed through or disrupted without really having any noticeable effect. Um, but the eloquent sites, areas that control motor function or sensory function or speech, vision, those are things that we call eloquent. Um, and then the pattern of drainage. So we talk about the arteries going into the veins. There's a number of draining veins of the AVM, and some of them come out to the surface, and some of them go deep down into the brain. And because when you re take out an AVM, you have to come around and literally cut across those veins. If they're very deep, that makes it a much more dangerous surgery to do. So you add up these points, and the risk of doing a surgery on an AVM can range anywhere from a Spetzler Martin grade one, which is a small AVM on the surface, where in Dr. Spetzler's series, and admittedly he's not your average neurosurgeon, but he had no patients with any kind of injury, and versus the grade five, which is the worst type of AVM, and then we talk about a much higher rate, 20% with minor deficits and 12% with major deficits. So that's what we as neurosurgeons look to in terms of AVMs to determine how safe it is to take an AVM out. Okay. You, um, I, I can't read the bottom sentence there. That uh, it's so these are the eloquent sites, and it says sensory motor, language, visual cortex, hypothalamus, thalamus, internal capsule, brainstem, cerebellar peduncles, or cerebellar nuclei. Those are just anatomic structures that we know. If you disrupt those with the lesion or by passing through them, you'll have okay. a, a, a Do an you effect. Know where yours was? Cerebellum, right? Right in the back, yeah. Back and part of the cerebellum is something you can remove and you won't notice. And part of the cerebellum is something you remove and you can have symptoms. And that's, that's what would distinguish whether it's eloquent or non-eloquent. Okay. Um, radio surgery we mentioned. If, for those of you that aren't familiar with gamma knife, this is really a picture of what a gamma knife uh, is. It's put the patient in a helmet. The helmet has a lot of little... Uh, holes and basically the patient is brought into proximity of radioactive cobalt and the holes are the only area that aren't shielded and so basically many small low doses of radiation are focused on a center target so it's kind of an ingenious way to deliver radiation to a very precise target and it's extremely effective for AVMs. Um, the nice thing about it is uh, it has a very low immediate morbidity, meaning if you put a patient in a machine with a gamma knife, they're really 100% of them going to walk right out there and not know that they had anything done. Um, and as we talked about, for small AVMs, less than 3 centimeters, with a very compact nidus, so not an AVM that's spread out, but one that's very easy to target, uh, and for those that surgery is not appropriate, so for those that are in very deep locations or eloquent locations, it's often a very good uh, way to treat them. At, in fact, at one year, we see rates of obliteration somewhere around 50%, and at two years, closer to 90%. The issue with gamma knife and why we don't use it for every AVM is because it doesn't work immediately. It's radiation, and it takes time to work. And 
it has a latency of one to three years for its effect. And because of that, during that period, you're, the patient's at a risk of having a hemorrhage. Uh, and so it's very useful for AV, AVMs that are not uh, good for surgical treatment, but it can be risky in terms of subjecting the patient to a risk for a couple years before it works. Uh, as well, there are some possibilities of delayed complications of radiation. So it's a, it's a useful tool, but it's uh, something that shouldn't necessarily be used for every uh, AVM. Do you know why the, um, the gamma radiation doesn't affect, as it passes through brain tissue to get to the AVM? Absolutely, but that's one, it, it's just a very, very small dose magnified by a very large number. So each area of the brain gets a tiny, tiny dose of radiation except the target, which gets everything. So it's a really nice way to focus radiation. You can draw a very precise target and hit that with just the radiation. What is the difference between that and the proton beam therapy? It's um, similar, but the I haven't heard anybody using proton beam for, uh, for vascular malformations. Uh, that's used more for skull-based tumors or, or bony tumors lower down. Um, so I, I don't actually uh, know of anyone who's used proton beam therapy for, for AVMs. I just wondered if the camera raised at all. There's not really, uh, we can target way in the center of the brain. The, the issue is uh, if you have an AVM that's near something like the brain stem, the stem coming up the brain, or near the, the nerves, the cranial nerves, the nerves to the face, um, then it becomes tricky to target only the AVM and not the surrounding tissue. But in terms of depth, it, uh, you can get anywhere with the AVM. Exactly. So embolization is what we'll really talk about here. And um, just broadly speaking, it's occlusion of a blood vessel. So just blocking a blood vessel using some sort of embolic agent. That's why it's called embolization. The point is to block the blood supply um, and or to prevent bleeding. And it's a alternative in some cases, and in other cases it's an adjunct, so use it with surgery. And people use it in all different organ systems, uh, uterine arteries, liver arteries, bleeding in the lung, bleeding from the nose. But what we'll talk about mostly is brain and spine, and specifically brain embolization. And the history is a little bit interesting. Um, for brain embolization, back in the 60s, this a gentleman named Lucenhop, who was at Georgetown, who was a radiologist, um, reported the use of uh, methyl methacrylate emboli for the embolization of a cerebral AVM. So there's some interesting pictures uh, here in the literature where they would uh, literally do a direct injection into the carotid artery in the neck uh, of these small little particles, essentially. And because we talked about the high flow to the AVM and the blood tends to flow to the AVM itself and not to the normal brain, uh, they would actually pull the particles into the AVM and it would block off some of the blood flow to the AVM. And that's really the, the beginnings of, of embolization. And that became more advanced. Um, here there's some other interesting pictures where he developed a, a system where he had a basically a glass tube that he would uh, stitch into the cr external carotid artery. And then he developed these um, balloon-tipped, uh, essentially, tubes, little catheters, um, and he could actually let the flow drive those balloon tips again to the area of the AVM, and then he could inflate them um, and then decide if he wanted to uh, leave them there or pull them back. So it's, uh, again, very early embolization. Here's an old uh, picture uh, where he has, it's hard to see here on this old angiogram, but this is the AVM, and he's basically directed this embolus up to the top of the blood vessel there. And these two gentlemen published a, a series of these embolizations in uh, 1975, patients with large AVMs, and they changed their materials along the way, so they started using these silastic spheres 
uh, with metallic markers and other um, materials, and they generally were about two and a half to four millimeters in diameter, and they would, again, send them directly up into the arteries in the neck, and they quote, they quoted, or they were quoted as saying that putting these materials in the groin, which is what we do today, um, has only restricted application because of the limits on the size of the emboli. So it's just kind of interesting the way they started thinking about this, and you can see here on... Similar, similar. It's more embolization. Coiling is a type of embolization, but it's an extremely targeted type, and we, we can talk about that a little bit, where you're putting everything specifically into the aneurysm and not into the blood vessel, uh, whereas what we're talking about with AVMs, you actually want to block the blood vessel. You want to close off the blood vessel. Exactly. And so here they have these metal balls. You can very well see on the x-rays that are sitting in the AVM uh, and closing it off. And obviously what we do today is extremely uh, different from what they did in the past. And um, just the development of what we do, going from basically launching these particles from the, from the blood vessel and letting them flow versus what we do, which is essentially steer and direct our catheters up. So uh, that took the development of these tiny catheters with soft tips. Um, and in the 70s, the, these were developed by another radiologist, but they didn't have uh, the same materials that we have, and so essentially they would drive these catheters up and they would just cut into the wall of the carotid artery, causing a, an injury to the artery wall. So this was a real, um, a real inhibition to, to progress in this field. In the 80s, we developed, or they developed, uh, the ability to put small catheters over a tiny wire, which would let you drive a softer wire through the blood vessel and bring the catheter over it, which is really what we do today. And we also use some other techniques. So if you're thinking about uh, driving catheters around in a patient, we still use the same x-rays that they used to use, and we inject contrast dye, and it gives you a picture of the blood vessels. But what we do now is use something called road mapping, where you take a picture of a AVM, and so this is the injection, which is typically in black, and then you basically turn the color white and then this is the map that we use to drive our catheters along the blood vessel to the area that we want to use. And so that was an extremely important technique that was developed in the late 70s uh, and that we use every day today still in the angio suite. And again, all these techniques let us get the microcatheters right where we want them, which is right up to the AVM, um, where we can start uh, filling the blood vessels. Uh, another recent thing we've developed is, if you imagine, this is just the x-ray picture, and this is, and we'll talk more about this, this is a picture of that material called onyx, uh, which we'll talk about more in a second, but in order to drive a catheter all the way out here along these blood vessels, we need uh, some stability to our system, so we've developed these catheters that are called distal access catheters, you actually have a catheter in the artery in the leg, you have a catheter in the neck, and now you have a catheter up in the head, and then you put another catheter through it. And so these are just uh, different levels of stability, essentially. With each catheter within a catheter, you're able to steer a wire, a catheter more uh, precisely. So now we'll talk quickly about embolisates, and so what it is today that we inject. Um, and we uh, recently, in the last couple of decades, used particles, we'll talk about, ethanol, which is literally pure alcohol, drinking alcohol, um, coils are often used in AVMs, and liquid embolic agents are what we use mostly today. So particles have changed over time. People have used just silk sutures, they've used these silastic emboli, anything from muscle, gel foam, which is an absor absorbable gelatin sponge, or historically they'd even take a blood clot out of a patient and re-inject it in to block the vessel. Um, particles these days are a little bit disfavored in terms of AVMs. Uh, it's, it's still the kind of thing where you're essentially launching a small particle and letting it go where it goes. So it's difficult to control where they go. Um, even when they block off an artery, it, it can tend to reopen itself. And some particles that were used caused actually an inflammation of the blood vessel, so they weren't completely neutral. They still do it, 
different, and we'll talk about one kind of particles that we still use. It's called poly, polyvinyl alcohol, and it's a very neutral uh, uh, particle, but they still have those uh, downsides where you can't really direct exactly where it goes. But we do use it for things like nosebleeds, where there's tiny little vessels everywhere, and you can't possibly target every one, so we just want to kind of block off the general small vessels temporarily because the nose will stop bleeding if you do that. Um, ethanol is disfavored. Mostly uh, uh, it causes sclerosis of the vessel, so it actually burns the blood vessel. Um, and it's still used in some ABMs and other body systems, but in the brain it causes swelling and it can actually cause seizures. Coils we do use, and I'll show one case where we did put coils. Um, they tend to be useful to block a large vessel, uh, but they tend to be less useful in smaller vessels because the coils themselves are pretty big. And uh, trying to coil up a coil precisely in a tiny blood vessel is often difficult. Um, so really what we use today, we talked briefly about this PVA, which is polyvinyl alcohol. Uh, but really what we use today is two materials. One is called uh, NBCA, it's a cyanoacrylate, it's literally a superglue, and it's essentially a liquid that when it hits the blood, it hardens, and it's mixed with the material that enables us to see it. The problem with uh, the glue is that it actually sticks uh, like glue should. We say that it's very adhesive, so it sticks to the blood vessel wall, which is what we wanted to do, but it also sticks to the microcatheter. So we inject glue, we have to rapidly withdraw the microcatheter. Onyx is something that's been around now for uh, about eight years on the market, and it's what we use the most for ABMs. It's a something called ethylene vinyl alcohol copolymer, uh, and it's mixed with DMSO, is dimethyl sulfoxide, which is a solvent, and it is um, and then some tantalum powder, which is a contrast material. And it is actually very nice. It's non-adhesive. We say that it's cohesive. So the onyx that we use sticks to itself, but not to the blood vessel wall and not to the catheter. It actually flows like lava. And essentially, as it's deposited in the vessel, the DMSO uh, leaches out and the material solidifies. So it, this process happens pretty slowly. So it allows us to be m more slow in our injection and as a result, we can get better penetration into the ABM. This is the, the product that is got a horrible scent. Exactly. The DMSO the has a horrible scent. That the scent is just nauseating. It's, it can be uh, nauseating. It's something I didn't appreciate for probably six months of mm -hmm. using it. Um, but and that's the onyx? The, well, the, the on, it's the material the onyx is, oh, okay. is dissolved in, essentially. Mm -hmm. So um, the DMSO is not. DMSO smells so bad. So does it come out of the, also of the, the body? The body, like, yeah. So it, how long does the patient's stay? It's a couple of days. Really? A that couple bad? days, yeah. And it's in their breath, it's in their sweat. What does it smell like? I can't the, describe it. Yeah, like one death. before the other. <laughs> the glue. Yeah. yeah. Does that smell also? No smell for super glue whatsoever. Why use, why use this then? New, it, well, it has it has these properties that we were talking about, and I'll show you some cool pictures. So this is um, onyx on the left, and because it's uh, it's actually suspended in DMSO, and so it needs to be on a shaker for 20 minutes before we use it. And then we have basically the interface. This is the onyx mixed up, and this is just pure DMSO in the catheter, and we just inject the onyx into the catheter, and we have an interesting picture here. So this is what it looks like if it's coming into water and also into a blood vessel. It, it flows like lava. I mean, it really, it sticks to itself. It's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. If you, um, when I was a child, they had these firework type things that you lit and yeah, they would, the snakes, the snakes exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it, right. it kind of looks like. It's spongy. And why use it is because we can be very, very controlled in our injection. Like I said, with the glue, it goes out of the catheter, and you have a split second. You pull your, and you're done. And you have a little bit less control over where that glue is going. And with the onyx, uh, you can just stop your injection, and it will stop, and you can redirect it. And it's, 
It's, it has very nice properties. That must have been what they used on me because when they rolled me back into the recovery, uh, my wife asked what the smell was, and they said it was from the glue. Yeah, and I don't understand why I didn't smell it for six months. It must have had to. Is that the same DMSO that was controversial? We used to use it for arthritis treatments and things like that. Probably, yeah. It, it penetrates the skin very easily. Uh, in fact, when I'm using it in a case, I can taste it in my mouth. Uh, very small amounts. Yeah. We had, uh, goodness, the Somebody. Manny. Yeah. Okay, Manny came in and he was showing us the coils in August or July and explaining the cost of some of these procedures. Yes. And of course, with the coils, you're charging by pretty much the centimeter, the amount of wire that you use. Essentially. How do you charge with the sonics? It's the vial. Really? The vial, yeah. So each vial is a little portion, or you pay for the whole vial. I, I think you pay for the whole vial, and each vial is a a, a cc, so a, a um, milliliter essentially. And um, some cases will use a fraction of a vial. Other cases will use multiple vials. Really? Yeah. And I don't actually know the specific cost, but it, it's this is definitely a high cost material. Uh, the glue would be significantly cheap. But is this the preference? Uh, it depends on who you ask. I think, um, I think, for instance, here Dr. McDougall tends to favor onyx. Dr. Albuquerque tends to use a mix of onyx and glue. They both have their place. It really what depends. What happen if, when you're using the glue, if you don't get? The it would stick. The catheter would stick. So, how do you get it out? Yeah, then So, and that's a good question because we, and we talk to patients about this with, with, it's actually interesting because the glue sticks to the catheter and the onyx sticks less. However, the catheter gets stuck in a patient more frequently with onyx. And that's because we're not so worried about it sticking, so we allow the onyx to go both into the AVM and back along the catheter, and we're less concerned about that, but ultimately, it does stick a little bit, and you have to remove the catheter at the end of the case, and it may have some amount of adhesion to the onyx, and so that's a very difficult situation for us, because if we pull too hard, the catheter can break, or the blood vessels can move, and that can cause a problem, or the flip side is leaving the catheter, and thankfully, most of our cases are going to the operating room the next day, so we just recently did a case where we left the catheter. We left it in our sheet overnight, and in the operating room, they took out the AVM, and they cut across the catheter that was stuck in the AVM, and we pulled the catheter out. Wait, I'm confused. I thought this was a fix-all, so they're still going to the surgery room to have the AVM? Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is not a fix-all. Oh, this is just to stop the immediate... Rupture. The, well, this is still having a craniotomy. Yeah, this is embolization, and the embolization is for the most part we do it before surgery. We typically don't do it and then not do surgery. It's very, very difficult and controversial whether um, you can cure an AVM without taking it out, because we can close down an AVM completely with this stuff, but. Most people think that if you wait a few years, the AVM will open up again. So why not just do surgery to begin with? Because we think that doing this first makes the surgery safer because there's less bleeding. And that's Dr. Spetzler's philosophy, and that's a philosophy shared by most, most neurosurgeons. So the choice is either you're getting the gamma knife or you don't have a choice. You're going into, you're going into surgery. For the most part, yeah. And, we, we'll, and we'll mention that quick, and I can maybe skip ahead yeah, to that, actually. This is, this is uh, just an interesting picture of an AVM, but what you see in this AVM is dark vessels. So those are vessels that are filled with onyx, and that kind of helps the resection and marks the AVM. The, you know, because I got the most likely the onyx because it smelled so bad when yeah. I got back to recovery. They, they didn't do any subsequent operation, and, and I think that's what they were concerned about um, yeah. because of where it was located, and they felt that if they went in 
from my training. But. Yeah. Well, then, and that is um, there. We can jump ahead a little bit because some of this is. Um, we can talk about more interesting things, but um, there there are increasing reports of people curing AVMs by embolization, but that's a new thing really since since the onyx came out, and especially in Europe, a lot of the practitioners are using onyx and not doing surgery. But still in the United States, we, we tend to have uh, a bias towards going to surgery, even if it almost looks like it's all shut down. So do you tell the patients, we're going to do this, and then you will likely have to have surgery? For, for the most part here, the patients are coming to Dr. Spetzler, and he's saying, we're going to do surgery and we're going to do embolization before that. And I th it's, it's, it's rare that we will not do surgery after an embolization unless in a yeah, particular... That's like three years later, right? I mean, are you talking... Are, are, no, do you do this for No, hours? we're... Oh, yeah, okay. we're, we're doing... Em we're saying you have to... Okay. Yeah. I got no, this just a quick question. The onyx, um, once the DMSO is gone, is it solid or is it still semi-malleable, kind of like rubber? Or? It's, it's solid, but it's not hard solid. It's spongy solid. It's like a sponge. That picture of the AVM, was that with the onyx in it? Yeah. Yes. After you removed after surgery? The dentist didn't have to do the operation. He said he didn't have to go back for, to make sure. That's Robin is real worried about dentists, okay? So sure. Well, yeah, the, the part, of, part of the reason I had a blood disorder with the um, I factor five deficiency. Sure. So, um, feeling that that was part of the cause for my situation. Sure. And so, I'm on just on blood thinners, but uh, you know, my assumption would be that if after all the scans that they did, I mean, yeah. they would have found something else. They had me coming back. No. No. I mean, four months afterwards, they did another angiogram. Angiogram. Well, they didn't. They didn't see any uh, weakened blood vessels or anything yeah. else. Well, he's you. You. You've gotten a recent scan, or yeah. how? How long has it been? Um, 2008, Christmas 2008. And he embolized you, and then yeah. he did another angiogram, and then he yeah. Was four cured. months later, he he did another angiogram and not, said everything was fine. That. Yeah. Well, that's not that's not weird necessarily. Again, this is, um, you know, there's a paradigm of, of uh, some of the goals of treatment. But if you uh, have an AVM that's in a difficult location and you do an embolization and the AVM is gone, and you check again and the AVM is gone, then that's a point where it's not worth going in to resect an AVM and that's cause gone. Other problems. Uh, yeah, it, I it, think that was their their major fear that yeah. if they would have gone in for my cranium here, that yeah. the, uh, the chances of me coming out uh, semi normal would have been pretty slim. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's not un unreasonable. I would say that's not that's not the norm, but but uh, there's a whole spectrum of possibilities here. Um, No. In fact, we do do embolization uh, before the gamma knife in some... Doesn't the gamma knife affect the, at, at a cell level to where the cells grow and, and fill up the ABM? Correct. To make it solid? Correct. So, yeah, in that sense that, that you could think of it as a form of embolization. But we, we don't think tend to think of it that way, although, yeah, I would say very protracted, slow developing embolization. That's one way of thinking of it. But we do do embolization sometimes in conjunction with gamma knife. So we talked about how gamma knife works very well for very small AVMs. It doesn't work so well for very big AVMs. So sometimes we'll use embolization to turn a big AVM into a small AVM. So if you have different parts and you have a part that's over here, we could close that with embolization and then gamma knife a different part and treat it that way. Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting use of uh, embolization. 
another thing we do sometimes with embolization is if there's a big ABM and there's one part that looks extremely dangerous, uh, we may try to target that. That's what we were talking about, an, an aneurysm deep within an AVM. We may try to embolize just that part because we are worried about that part. We may not be so worried about the rest of the AVM. Um, and in some patients, actually, where they have an AVM that's so massive that we, there's no way to treat it, and they're having symptoms because the AVM is stealing blood flow or putting pressure, we may actually do a AVM embolization. We call it palliative, where we try to shut down part of the AVM. We typically don't do that. But in the case where a patient's having symptoms that are progressing and there's no option, we may target just a part of the AVM. Um, these are just a couple of cases that may or may not when be. When does clipping come into effect for the AVMs? So clipping uh, isn't really used for AVMs so much. It, it, clipping is, is used for aneurysms. It's used to exclude the aneurysm from the blood vessel. You have a bubble, you put a clip on it. In AVM surgery, the only time you would use a clip is if you had a big artery or a big vein that you wanted to close. You might put a clip on it, but then you would later cut that vessel and remove the clip for the most part. You're not, you're not going to put a clip uh, to try to close an AVM. You're going to try to take the AVM out. That's just a different... Uh, theory, essentially, a different way to treat it. Uh, I guess if you had it, because AVMs tend to have many, many different feeding vessels, you'd have to put many, many, many clips, uh, and that just uh, isn't as, as um, effective or as worthwhile as what Dr. Spetzler might do, which is use cautery to close down the blood vessels and then cut to take out the AVM. Is that old school? Was that used at one time? I don't think anyone's ever used uh, no, clips for AVMs. Uh, probably, again, just to close a single vessel, but not to treat the whole AVM. Okay. So some of this stuff is a little esoteric. So potentially we'll just conclude, and we can have any more questions that you guys might have. So AVMs are congenital lesions, so that's an important point. They're diagnosed frequently in younger patients. Uh, treatment options, surgery is the mainstay. We do do embolization, and typically it's to support surgery or radiosurgery, and then there's radiosurgery for ones that we don't think we can safely operate on. And uh, we're seeing year by year changes in endovascular embolization techniques and materials that will allow us over time to do this in a safer fashion. And ultimately, I think... Uh, there may be a day when we're doing all AVMs just endovascularly and curing them all and not, not needing to do surgery. Uh, I certainly could see that happening in the future. What are the uh, developments with treatments? Like what new research projects are out there or what different treatment options are some of the device companies working on that the products in Well, interestingly, for the market seems to be more interested uh, or focused in aneurysms and uh, in stents and coils and devices. We haven't seen a lot of new stuff since Onyx came out for AVMs. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why that is. There's some work being done on some different types of liquid embolics. I think Mark Pruhl and the guys here are actually working with a group of engineers at University of Arizona trying to develop new similar kind of liquid polymers to, uh, to close down AVMs. Um, for us, it's been mostly the catheters. So f developing tiny catheters that can get farther, that are softer, that are easier to drive, wires. It's not very sexy developments, I would say, in terms of the endovascular stuff, but it's been mostly access to the AVM. Um, in terms of the research, people are uh, working to try to understand what kind of, uh, how AVMs develop. Um, because clearly there's, there is some um, abnormal growth that happens through growth factors, and uh, there's some thought that if you can understand how the AVMs develop, you might be able to reverse that process. But the AVM does, so you're born with one. 
Correct. And over time, most likely as you grow, that's going to it grow It changes. As well. It changes, yeah. It changes both in size, um, but also in response to um, the environment around it. So because there's high flow, there can be changes to the blood vessels. So the blood vessels can develop little aneurysms. They can expand a little bit. The veins can stretch. Um, there's hypoxia, we call it, so the tissues get starved of oxygen, and when that happens, they secrete growth factors in response to that, and that might also play a role in the expansion or changes in an ABM. So for um, children, what, like, how many, like, um, brain aneurysms, 18 uh, for a hundred, had a brain aneurysm, right? Well, we talked about 18 out of 100,000 was the prevalence of ABM. Okay, what about if, should you, like, if something for children? Yeah. What, like, 20? Should you, like a, like a vaccination? I mean, don't, but something like that. Yeah, you're saying whether we should screen for yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I think the numbers are still so low. Mm -hmm. Um, that for any given child, uh, people aren't going to advocate screening at this point. Unless there's a history. Yeah, unless there's a history or symptoms. I mean, well, that I, goes with Betsy's question since she knows that hurt, right? Yeah, I'm that her great grandfather and her father. So should she be looking for children and her grandson? Yeah. You know, I don't. Uh, if it were, if we were talking about brain aneurysms, yes. yeah, if we were talking about brain aneurysms, there, people think nowadays that if you have two first degree relatives that have an aneurysm or subarachnoid hemorrhage, that the rest of the family should be screened. And we talk about doing that with MRA, so a non-invasive screen. Um, for AVMs, I don't know of any similar recommendations because I think the number of familial cases is so low. Um, so I don't know that anyone would recommend uh, screening, but you know, if it's, 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 if it's, it's proven, proven that it's hereditary. Yeah. 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 And it's well, let me a, ask if this was in your family, would you have your children in there? Uh, screened? I would say if it were my family and there were multiple first degree relatives with something, even if there was a rec not a recommendation for screening, I would explore that as an option, sure. I don't know how easy that is to do or, or whatnot. Um, the, the other issue with uh, AVMs is they're sometimes difficult to detect. Depends on how big they are <clears throat> um, on a traditional MR, so you'd have to get an MRA. Um, and I think the sensi sensitivity may be a little bit lower than for a brain aneurysm for an MR, but something I would I would explore. I, I, there is no recommendation that I know of for that. Though. So, when you're talking, you were talking about catheters and feeding them up through the yes veins and so forth, the arteries. Um, are they just like a rotor rooter that you? Push up there. Are you <laughs> in way or? No, so it's uh, it's all wire and catheter. So we work through a tube in the leg, and we okay. basically send a wire that we can see on the X-ray, and we drive that wire. So the wire is stiff enough that we can work at one end and push it, and it has a soft tip, so it's not damaging anything, and there's a little curve to it, so we can twist the wire and we can steer it essentially okay. and we have a catheter that we just advance over the wire and so we send the wire up into the brain and we're, we're working here with our hands and the, ca the wires are deep in the brain That's so it's amazing. it's some remarkable engineering feat to be able to to have that uh, amount of control of something 150 centimeters away. And you do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what it's not Dr. Pesnick here. Yeah. Huh? It was for an aneurysm, but that's what Dr. Yeah. Klesnick in Houston, when we went in, oh, that's what yeah. he was doing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. With the symptoms that uh, I'd had going into the hospital, were 
my motor functions on my right side. Sure. Vision. My right eye looked at my nose. <laughs> Regardless of sure. where I was looking. Um, what, ca what caused that? Just the pressure on my brain there? Or? Well, I, I don't know your specific case, but if we're talking about <clears throat> an AVM that's down close to the brain stem, which is the the center of the brain essentially and controls all the functions as they descend down to the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. It could be from pressure because if, again, with the pressure in the AVM, the expansion of the vein, and there's not much space back there, so that could push directly against the brain stem and cause symptoms. It could also be like we talked about, the blood being pulled away from the brain stem. We call that steel, so the AVM could have been stealing uh, blood. Um, and then obviously if the AVM bled and caused a blood clot, that could push against the, the brain stem. So I think most likely it was just pressure because in that area there's not a lot of space. Any other questions?